1492, it could be argued, was the most transformative year in the history of the world. That year, for the first time in more than 15,000 years, human beings from opposite sides of the planet, from the eastern and western hemispheres, came into contact with each other. The consequences of this contact for the course of world history cannot be exaggerated. In the year 1492, the countries of Europe were relatively obscure, weak, and overshadowed by the much larger powers of Asia. China, and the Islamic empires. As a result of the invasion of the Western Hemispheres, beginning with the Spanish conquest made possible by the voyages of Christopher Columbus, European powers would expand dramatically over the next four centuries, ultimately coming to dominate more than 80% of the globe. The process by which these small nations in Europe did this is called imperialism. Imperialism is the state policy, practice, or advocacy of extending power and dominion, especially by direct territorial acquisition or by gaining political and economic control of other areas. Empires have existed everywhere and all throughout history, but the European empires that emerged in the 15th century were especially noteworthy for the fact that they were overseas empires as opposed to land-based entities. The European empires that arose after 1492 practice a particular form of imperialism in the Americas, colonization or colonialism. That is, Europeans not only explored and conquered territories overseas, but settled those lands and exploited their resources. Through empire and colonization, Europeans amassed tremendous power that fundamentally reshaped the continents bordering the Atlantic Ocean and ultimately the entire world. And it all began with a mistake. In the 15th century, European rulers believed that the key to power lay not in the West, but in the East in the lucrative ports of the Far East, where merchants and monarchs could become wealthy through the trade in luxury goods that had moved for ages across the Silk Road. Silk, porcelain, perfumes, spices, precious stones, tea, cotton, sugar, drugs. Tapping into and dominating those trade routes in the Far East was the particular obsession of the monarchs of the Iberian Peninsula, of Portugal, and the kingdoms that would form Spain. These European rulers were fiercely competitive with each other, and by 1492, Portugal, using new sailing technology and knowledge of the seas, had gained a position in the ocean routes around the African coast and over into the Indian Ocean, establishing forts at strategic points along the way and tapping into local trade networks inside of Africa. In 1469, Isabella and Ferdinand were married joining their territories to form the Kingdom of Spain. These two were exceptionally ambitious, zealously Catholic, and determined to challenge Portuguese hegemony in the seas. Hungry for power, they were ripe for a, a wild scheme. That scheme was delivered to them by the navigator Cristoforo Colombo, a modestly talented Genoese sailor Columbo, or Columbus, as he's come down in history, had for nearly a decade been imagining a plot to sail to the East Indies, to enrich himself and his sponsors, and to convert Asian peoples to Christianity for a final crusade against Islam. His scheme hinged on an audacious plan to sail not east around Africa as the Portuguese had done, but to sail west, out into the Atlantic Ocean, to circumnavigate the globe, and approached China's glorious markets from the other side of the world. Although it was a radical plan, it was actually a quite logical idea if you were an intellectual in the 15th century. Columbus had spent many years studying geography and making maps, and contrary to popular myth, educated Europeans in this period did not think the earth was flat. Like the ancient Greeks, they understood the world was a globe, and even knew its dimensions, roughly 24,000 miles around. <laughs> 
But here's the thing. Columbus was not exactly the modern scientist he's often made out to be. He had one foot in the scientific world and one in the medieval. And so he drew in part on the Bible for his geographical theories, coming up with an estimate of the world's size that was some 6,000 miles smaller than the actual size of the world. Based on his calculations, he believed that by sailing west, he could reach Japan in 3,500 miles. In fact, Columbus was more than 10,000 miles off the mark. That is one very great mistake. Fortunately for him and the crew of his three ships, there were two entirely unknown continents between Europe and Asia. Otherwise, he would have sailed out into the Atlantic Ocean and sailed forever until he drowned and would never be heard from again. And there'd be no such thing as Columbus Day. Anyway, Columbus was shopping his scheme around Europe for almost 10 years, and famously, no one was interested in what appeared to be a far too risky endeavor. This was when history brought his visions and ambitions into contact with the lust and zeal of the Spanish king and queen. Anxious to challenge Portugal's expanding power and desperate for sources of gold to enrich their new kingdom, the monarchs agreed to finance half of Columbus's expedition provided he claim all discovered land and resources in the name of the Spanish cr crown. He would also be allowed to keep 10% of any revenue generated from his expeditions. The king and queen also granted Columbus noble status and gave him the ranks of viceroy, governor, and admiral. The last one, admiral, he wore with particular pride. With three ships and 90 men under his command, Columbus departed Spain in early August 1492. He followed the route, first to the Canary Islands, and then west, propelled by the trade winds. In mid-October, he and his crew made landfall on an island in the Bahamas, just east of Florida. He then entered the Greater and Lesser Antilles, islands framing the Caribbean Sea, assuming that he had landed in the East Indies in Asia. Assuming he, he assumed he had went all the way around the gl globe and was in the Indian Ocean. There, he came upon a seafaring and indigenous, indigenous people, descendants of the Arawak-speaking peoples of South America called the Taino. The Taino were organized into five chiefdoms and territories on the large island, or modern-day Haiti and Dominican Republic. There were 29 chieftains on modern Cuba, chiefdoms also in Puerto Rico. The largest population center was around 3,000 people. We can't be sure what the Taino called the islands that they lived on, but Christopher Columbus immediately began naming everything in sight in Spanish and for Spain. Havana, Baracoa, Bayamo, Hispaniola. It was not only places that Columbus renamed. Believing he had landed in Asia, somewhere in the islands in the Indian Ocean's edge, he called the people that he, quote, discovered Indians. This despite the fact that they were unlike any people he had ever read about. Columbus was at first awed by his so-called new discovery. He touted Hispaniola as a paradise and wrote in his journal and do, uh, letters to the king and queen about the beauty and the childlike innocence of the indigenous people. But his revelry soon gave way to anxiety as he set to work searching for sources of profit, particularly gold. Showing off his guns to the indigenous people, he declared the land a colony of Spain and began taking people and setting them to work. He renamed himself Christoferens, meaning Christ bearer which shows his zeal to convert these people to Christianity, people who had no idea at all at first what he was talking about. Now, this brings us to a little segment that I like to call, How Do We Know? In this case, how do we know what Christopher Columbus thought about his arrival in this land, previously known to Europeans? Now, on the surface, it seems we have some rich documentation. There is the journal or the Diario of Christopher Columbus, with detailed entries on his exploration of the islands. We also have a letter written the next year in 1493 to Ferdinand and Isabella expressing his thoughts about his expeditions and his voyages. And in fact, once word reached Europe as, of his voyage, it spread very quickly throughout the new medium, medium of the printing press, generating considerable enthusiasm across Europe for expeditions to the, quote, New World. But we need to be a little cautious as scholars of history. Neither the journal nor Columbus's letter to the monarch survives in its original manuscript form. What we have of the journal are abstracts with some direct quotes made by the friar uh, 
de la Casas many decades after the fact. As for the letter, scholars have had to rely on printed editions, many of them published without date or location, to reconstruct the history of the letter itself. To do this, there is a specialized field of study called textual scholarship. That is, the study of the way that documents were written and edited in order to make arguments about time and place. Through various methods and forms of careful research, textual scholars are able to make very compelling claims for the validity of sources that have problematic histories of transmission. Now, given all this, I'd like you to pay particularly close attention to the way that Christopher Columbus's letter to the Spanish king and queen is written, to the ideas, to the words, and the images that he evokes to describe the Americas and the peoples living there. What does his letter tell you? about European attitudes toward this new world. Now, in March 1493, disappointed with the lack of fabulous Eastern wealth, Columbus took some captives with him back to Spain to show off to the monarchs and to entice them to give him more funding. The Spanish king and queen were thrilled and immediately sponsored another expedition for exploration, colonization, and conversion of peoples to Christianity. What happened next made Columbus's voyage one of enduring and global significance. Because of the printing press, words spread all over Europe fast. Columbus's account of his voyage went rapidly through nine editions between 1493 and 1500. The Portuguese immediately recognized that the game had changed. In 1494, the rulers of Portugal met with the rulers of Spain to hash out a deal to un avoid undue confrontation by agreeing to literally divide the world in half between the two of them. And what you see here on this map is the map that is the 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 decision that Portugal and Spain made to divide the world. Everything within the center of those two line, dotted lines was claimed for Portugal. Everything on the outside was claimed for Spain. This was done through the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494. The Treaty of Tordesillas was, of course, a ridiculous expression of European, European hubris, the idea that two little tiny countries in Europe could divide the whole world. But it was one that actually would take root and shape the future of the Americas. So as you see on this map, that dotted line comes down across South America uh, with the Portuguese sphere becoming Brazil and everything on the outside of that sphere for Spain. And that's actually the way that Brazil and the rest of South America evolved with Spanish and Portuguese influence. So this ridiculous kind of division actually had long-term effects. Columbus w returned to Hispaniola to find that the Taino had revolted and killed those he had left uh, to hold the fort. Columbus then waged a holy war of vengeance in response, using dogs, horses, gunpowder, and steel to punish the indigenous Taino peoples, killing and capturing hundreds. Columbus shipped 550 captives back to Spain in 1495 to sell as slaves in order to continue funding his expeditions. Most of them died on the trip back to Europe, so Columbus switched to using Indians as plantation workers and as sex slaves on the islands. By 1496, Columbus had established a tribute system for the rest of the inhabitants. Although some Spaniards were horrified by this, and the monarchs even declared Indians to be, quote, free and not subject to servitude, Columbus exploited a, a Spanish law that said that capture and enslavement could be justified if done as part of a, quote, just war. That is a war against non-Christians. Here's the thing. The colonizer's mind arrived in the Americas with Christopher Columbus. From the very beginning, he treated the islands and the Taino as the Portuguese had treated the Canary Islands and the Guanche as commercial plantations and forced labor, resources to be exploited. And as far as we can tell, Columbus went to his death, never knowing where he was, still believing he had discovered some unknown part of Asia. Following Columbus's mistake, the Spanish invasion of the Americas was unbelievably rapid, as growing shipping, cargoes, and colonists connected the European and American shores of the Atlantic. In the first decades of conquest, it was also undeniably brutal and chaotic. We can characterize this period by taking a look at the type of men who spearheaded this wave. 
the conquistadors. Indeed, the conquistadores were a type of man that emerged from centuries of crusading against Muslims, war in Europe, and the Reconquista in the Iberian Peninsula. In particular, these were Iberian men, Spanish and Portuguese of the Hildago class, who came to the New World in search of social and economic advancement. Generally, they were men who had not inherited any money, who had a tough time amassing land and power in an over-crammed Europe, and saw the Western Hemisphere as a golden opportunity to succeed economically and socially in society back in Europe. You could think of them also as independent military contractors. They led private enterprise expeditions licensed by the crown in Europe, which reserved one-fifth of plunder and sovereignty over conquered lands, developed in the course of the Reconquista in Spain and applied to the Canary Islands. It was a system that reflected the monarchy's chronic shortage of cash and manpower. Now, take a little look at this map and imagine the assault that this represented on the Western Hemisphere. How was this done? Well, with the Portuguese experience with the Canary Islands as a colonial model, Spain aggressively settled on and modified Hispaniola and newly conquered lands in South and Central America. Personal plunder and imperialism reinforced each other. The conquistadores immediately tore into the continent, searching for wealth through resources easy to extract, especially gold and silver. And there was also simultaneous colonization of land for settlement and for growing lucrative cash crops like sugar. As we saw in the Canary Islands, the goal was to find a way to make as much money as possible and as quickly as possible. What was the best way to best stuff to grow? Cash crops, things like tobacco and sugar. These were labor intensive crops. The high demand for labor was supplied through forced coerced labor first of the indigenous populations and later African slaves. The millennia of East-West divide had a heartbreakingly tragic consequence for the Western Hemisphere. It kept, each other, it kept the peoples of each hemisphere inexperienced with each other's diseases. Europeans arrived with other unknown colonizers in their bodies, powerful microbes. Like the Guanche on the Canary Islands, Indians in the Caribbean began dying in massive waves upon the arrival of Europeans. And we're going to talk about this later in more detail. As the Indians died and could no longer be used for forced labor, they were replaced over time with slaves brought prim primarily from Africa. This whole thing reinforced the cycle of conquest and the pattern of colonization. The system that would evolve in the Atlantic Ocean region emerge in stages over the course of the next century. Transatlantic colonization was at first very difficult and deadly. Many people coming from Europe died on the way to the islands, and more died when they failed to grow enough food upon arrival. But for the native peoples, it was much worse, as Europe brought fatal diseases and forced, Europeans forced, forced them to work and provide food. As with the Guanche, colonization quickly destroyed the Taino. A 19, and the 1494 report, just two years after Columbus, reported that 50,000 Taino had already died. And, quote, they are falling every day, with every step, like cattle in an infected herd. From an original population of 300,000 at least in 1492, the population was down to 33,000 in 1510. And a mere 500 people were left from the original 300,000 by 1548. The Taino became extinct as a people soon thereafter. This mass extinction in the Western Hemisphere created the impression among later European arrivals that the land was empty and open for opportunity. And this was just the beginning. With the Taino of Cuba and Hispaniola dying in droves, the need for new slaves for gold mines, cattle ranches, and sugar plantations inspired Spanish entrepreneurs to push into Central America. Captured Indians related stories about a rich and populous empire in Central Mexico, stone temples and palaces, vast fields of maize and squash, immense populations, and great wealth and tribute, the Aztec Empire. Allured and appalled by the tales of human sacrifice, ambitious, ambitious Spaniards went on the search for this mythical land. This is Hernán Cortés, a Spanish hildago, that is, a member of the Spanish warrior caste. 
He left Spain in 1504 to try his luck in the, quote, new world, participated in the conquest of Cuba. Hearing rumors of a magnificent city of gold in Mexico, he disobeyed the orders of the governor of Cuba to find and invade the Aztec Empire. In 1519, Cortes and his army of about 350 men reached the capital of the Mexican Empire in Tecnoctitlan. To the Spaniards, the Mexico City Empire exceeded all of their dreams. The capital sat in a cluster of islands and a large lake interwoven with canals and long causeways, full of white adobe buildings and lofty aristocratic houses with courtyards and gardens, all dwarfed by the immense palace of the Emperor Montezuma. The population of Tecnoctitlan was perhaps 200 to 300,000 people, which dwarfed the largest Spanish city of Seville of 70,000. The Spaniards were awed at the shine and cleanliness and order of the metropolis. Montezuma knew that they were coming. He had heard of their approach, and he invited them in with hospitality. For a few months, it was not clear exactly who was hostage to whom. At some point, Cortez's men led a brutal assault on the Mexican nobles. The emperor was killed, and the Spanish were driven out by the Aztecs in 1520. They returned again the following year, and this time, after four months of fighting, the Spanish reduced the city to rubble. Aztec priests had been, were thrown to the war dogs to be devoured. The, nobles of, the Aztec nobles were tortured to reveal their hidden gold, and the population of Tecnoctitlan was reduced and subjugated. The conquest of Mexico became the foundation of a Spanish empire that 30 years later would be the greatest power in the Western Hemisphere. So how was it done? How did this fortune hunter able to, was this fortune hunter able to conquer the greatest power in central Mexico and an imperial city of 300,000 people? Furthermore, how would the Spanish then subjugate tens of millions of Indians all across the continent? Well, first of all, the Spaniards exploited fatal Aztec flaws. Aztec imperialism and practice of human sacrifice meant that a tributary empire had a weak base of loyalty. Cortes exploited this. In fact, when he returned in 1521, it was with tens of thousands of Indians from nearby regions that were strongholds and bitter enemies of the Aztecs and teamed up with the Spaniards in order to uh, fight the greater enemy. Another uh, major aspect is technology. For a long time, this was taken for granted as the decisive factor. And yes, the Spanish had superior military equipment. The Spanish had iron and steel, as opposed to stone, wood, and copper. The Spaniards also, of course, had guns. But these advantages have been, in the past, exaggerated. 16th century weaponry was not as reliable or as common as we imagine today. Uh, other things were important for explaining the uh, Spanish victory, such as their particular war tactics. Uh, Aztecs fought wars for surrender and tribute. That was the way, the, the culture of the Aztecs. The Spanish employed a vicious, scorched earth w warfare, killing everyone in sight. And this kind of scorched earth policy and massacre style of warfare gave them an advantage. And finally, unknowingly, the Spaniards employed biological warfare. This was perhaps their single greatest advantage. Smallpox came with Cortes and quickly decimated the population, as it had in Hispaniola among the Taino, and in the Guanche earlier on the Canary Islands. Thousands died, and thousands more were weak and defenseless among the Indian populations, and almost all suffered severe demoralization from the wave of death. Like the Black Death in Europe, the smallpox epidemic was interpreted through a cultural lens. Perhaps these newcomers were supernatural. Perhaps the safest bet was to submit to the rule of these new gods. So having already been to the city once, when smallpox was left behind. So when Cortes and his people returned, it was to a much more weakened um, base. Culture can be a really tragic thing also in the way that this is interpreted. The Spanish took the city and they remade it. They built churches, they collected tribute, and they used human captives as, sla as slaves to work in gold and silver mines.
But the conquistadors also had another advantage. That was their crusader mentality that they brought with them from Europe, which combined greed and religious zeal into a very powerful mixture. Hildagos like Cortes were from the Spanish gentry, not the upper mobility, uh, and rank-and-file soldiers were restless young men from middle ranks of Spanish society. They were contractors. They received no wages, but rather they received a piece of the booty at the end of an expedition. Plunder and slaves was the na were the name of the game, and this, of course, was a recipe for horror. Along with the crusade and the crusader kind of uh, mental makeup, uh, conquistadors like to believe that their greed served nobler aims, that they weren't just extending their own personal fortunes, but they were extending the Spanish monarchy and the church of the true God. Whenever they went plundering and enslaving, they scrupulously read the requerimiento, which was a document in which they ordered Indians to immediately accept Spanish rule and Christian conversion. Refusal to submit to the requerimiento even due to language differences, meant harsh punishments and justification for enslavement and warfare. This was an effective and horrific combination in the Crusader mentality. Now, word spread like lightning uh, through the conquistador ranks about what Cortes had found and beyond to other parts of Europe about his windfall, and conquest fired the imperial imagination, beginning a scramble across the New World, a frenzy for New Mexicos. Everyone wanted to hit the jackpot the way that Cortes did, to find some golden civilization and plunder it for its resources. Uh, it is no exaggeration to say that what we see here is an invasion of the Americas. Here's a map that just sort of gives you a sense of the chaos. Every one of these lines representing a major expedition coming over from Europe and uh, leveling an assault upon the, uh, quote, New World. Um, there is no exaggeration to call this an invasion. So beginning with Columbus's three voyages from 1492 to 1498, followed later by the voyages of Amerigo Vespucci, who gave his first name, Amerigo, got adopted to the form, to form America. Uh, later on, Vasco Nunez de Balboa, uh, in 1510, explored the Isthmus of Panama and crossed it, uh, uh, showing that there was a way to go over land to connect uh, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Ferdinand Magellan, uh, in 1519, sailed around the world. So this was the ambition that Columbus was going for is finally uh, realized in 1519, some 28 years, 27 years after Columbus's expedition. Uh, Pizarro, Francisco Pizarro conquered the Inca Empire in 1530 and 1533, the, 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 one of the, the major power center in South America, the Inca Empire. Uh, Hernando de Soto, from 1539 to 1542, went north and plundered into North America. He was also followed by Francisco Vasquez de Coronado shortly thereafter, moving north in search of uh, great treasure. And Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, 1542 to 1543, traveled all up and down the California coast, exploring uh, that area. As all this is going on, Europeans are gradually learning more and more about the world. As one of the, this is a famous map uh, showing the kind of distorted Western Hemisphere on the left, uh, all based on the limited knowledge that grows gradually over time. You see the continent of Africa almost in the center, and there's Asia over to the right, and the Western Hemisphere on the left. Um, this is the map right here, where for the, the it's the oldest example of the word America used to describe. Uh, the Western Hemisphere. Here's another really fascinating map. This shows you the sort of uh, half knowledge, the the growing and scattered and, and, and incomplete knowledge of the shape of North America. Uh, and for a long time, really over a century, many people in Europe, as you can see on the left, believe that California was an island, sailing up on the one side of on each either side of Baja California, and presuming that what they were that that they were the whole entire place was surrounded by uh, uh, water. This lasts for over a century. Some people in Europe thinking California is an island, gradually coming to understand the shape of the continents over time. 
Following rumors of gold and glory further north, Hernando de Soto and Francisco Coronado unleashed waves of violence and devastation on native peoples of what became the American Southwest. Hernán de Soto had made a fortune already plundering Central America and Peru, where he developed a particularly nasty streak of sadism, hunting Indians from horseback for sport. Uh, he believed that his own Tecnoctitlan, his own Mexico Aztec city, was somewhere north of Florida. Uh, in 1539, he led 600 men on a violent rampage through the heart of the Mississippian culture. Traverse present-day Florida, Georgia, South and North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, and East Texas on his mad quest for glory and riches. He came upon the Mississippian cultures, descendants of the peoples of Cahokia, and as far west as the Great Plains. He brought no food with him, but he did bring iron collars. Uh, he would come upon a chiefdom, ensnare the chief, and force the people to provide food to the, for their starving bellies. Resistance meant a savage response, cutting off a nose or a hand, throwing someone to the dogs, or, as archaeologists have discovered, he would burn people alive. Uh, finding only ceremonial centers and fields of cultivated food, DeSoto unleashed his disappointment on a string of uh, uh, unfortunate souls who became corpses. DeSoto sickened and died on the banks of the Mississippi River in 1542, and the survivors of his crew all slinked back to Mexico. Meanwhile, they left behind diseases that decimated the native peoples, turning these towns and centers into death traps for generations. By 1600, the region's population had been reduced to a small fraction of its previous numbers in North America. Francisco Vasquez de Coronado was very similar in his, in his uh, rampage through the American Southwest, uh, moving up through uh, what now is Arizona into New Mexico and as far as uh, Kansas, the Coronado exp Expedition. Again, you see the kind of frenzy here, this uh, sort of rampage through the North America looking for uh, sources of riches. He did this from 1450 to 14, uh, 1542. Uh, and he had been following Spanish probings into Pueblo villages now in New Mexico. During the 1530s, Francisco Pizarro, with a mere 180 men, conquered the Inca Empire, or Peru, practicing a ruthless and br brutality that would have shamed even Cortes. During the 1540s, Spanish forces gradually and painfully subdued the Mayan people of Central America. Spain longed to consolidate their empire, which had been a state of chaotic and violent flux. The smash-and-grab anarchy is no guarantee of loyalty and endurance, and the Spanish crown wanted to break Indian rulers and rule the peoples, but not decimate them. The vision of the Spanish monarchy was to remake native cultures and peoples, to introduce Spanish institutions, and to integrate new lands and new rule into the commerce of Spain. This vision they called New Spain. During the 16th century, the New World drew about 250,000 Spanish immigrants to the Americas from all social classes, but mostly from the middling classes. Almost all at first were men. This changed gradually over the centuries, but the uh, female immigration to New Spain was always very low from Europe. As a result, males took Indian wives and concubines. Off, mixed offspring resulted, which came to be called mestizos, which became a large population, especially in urban areas, and mixed with class and identity. In tropical lowlands, Indians replaced African slaves who bore children, introducing including mulattoes. A complex of race and culture was emerging that challenged all kinds of stark dualities uh, and also was built into society in, in forms of racial hierarchies. Imperialism enriched and empowered Spain beyond anything seen before in Europe. From 1500 to 1650, Spain shipped from the Americas to Europe about 181 tons of gold and 16,000 tons of silver. Most of this paid private debts, but a fifth of all this went straight to the crown's tax coffers. From there, the silver and gold went to Asia, enabling the purchase of unprecedented quantities of luxury goods like spice and cloth from the fabled uh, Far East. Um, Furthermore, the flood of cash encouraged aggressive and expensive military adventurism into North Africa, the Netherlands, Italy. Money was poured into a costly Spanish armada, 
to show everyone who, how bad the Spanish were. The Spanish, the money led to flaunting of power in Europe. At the Spain, at the time, Spain looked to be the most formidable power in the world. No one could foresee the dramatic decay of the economy and empire in the 17th century. Enriched, emboldened, the Spanish monarchy also enlisted its power in a series of religious wars in Europe following the Protestant Reformation. Finally, Spain's dramatic expansion served as an example and as a threat to all other would-be imperialists in Europe. Fear of Spanish domination, lust for their riches, and just big power politics kicked off a European convergence on the Western Hemisphere that would shape it and the world history in dramatic and irreversible ways. So in the 16th century, the Iberians, Sp Sp Spanish, and Portuguese were on top of the world. Spain was the largest, wealthiest power in Europe. And because of it, its mad invasion and conquest, the all the uh, of the Western Hemisphere, Portugal was fanning out all over the place. All of this was taking place within the context of rivalries and wars among European nations, wars that only intensified in the 16th century when the Protestant Reformation split Christian Europe in half, giving the battles on the continent a new religious energy. Now, Europeans are a jealous and competitive bunch of people, so this incredible expansion, along with the earlier success of the Portuguese, were by no means unnoticed. From the very start, as early as 1497, rival European powers in Europe, England and France, the Netherlands, were fanning out into the Atlantic for their own piece of the new booty. <laughs> 